in a maze of tunnels. Workers toil in darkness to unearth one of nature's most precious resources. While above ground, big boys with big toys seek the same prize in a supersized sandbox. Pulverized, processed, and poured, our world wouldn't be the same without this gleaming metal. Now, Silver Mines on Modern Marvels. It's in your car, on your photographs, and around your finger. You eat with it, compute with it, and admire its beauty. Silver is one of the most singular and versatile metals known to man. Silver is an amazing metal. It has the highest sheen of any metal, and it has the highest conductivity of any metal. Because it does not corrode, silver can be used in printed circuit boards, in switches, uh, where things have to work first time every time. That's where you need silver. And the only way to get silver is to mine it. There are two basic methods for mining silver. One is underground mining, where we have deep shafts going into the ground and, and the uh, workings of the mine follow veins. The other method is open pit mines, where large equipment is used to mine relatively near surface deposits of silver. Northern Idaho's aptly named Silver Valley has been a mining center since the mid-19th century. Over the decades, the region has produced 1.1 billion ounces of silver. Located here is the deepest operating silver mine in the United States. Hecla Mining Company is a 114-year-old mining company. We're here at the Lucky Friday Mine in Idaho, which is our primary silver-producing mine and has been operating since the 1940s. Lucky Friday sits in a picturesque tree-studded valley. Its small collection of muted green surface structures barely hints at what lies below, way below. The surface entrance into Lucky Friday extends straight down into the earth, 6,200 feet, equivalent to four and a quarter Empire State Buildings. Branching out from its cylindrical concrete shaft is a series of horizontal tunnels, or drifts. Three of the drifts extend out one mile from the shaft. The drifts terminate at the currently active ore veins, where smaller tunnels called stopes branch off. At the end of the stopes, you'll find the iconic figure that's carved out every inch of Lucky Friday's 20 miles of tunnels, the miner. It takes a special person to begin his shift by going down into a dark place. This is a real special breed of cat that works underground. Each day, dozens of miners call this netherworld of tunnels home. It's an environment that can be summed up in three words. Dark, wet, and warm. And be sure to come armed with earplugs, because it's also loud. Despite the extreme conditions, the entire mine has to operate like one giant, smoothly synchronized machine. Its goal is simple. To move as much silver ore out of the earth as possible, every day. And since Lucky Friday's miners get paid not by how many hours they work, but by how much ore they move, no one wants to be responsible for slowing down the machine. Arguably the most critical cog in the mine machine is the elevator hoist. The hoist runs the entire 6,200 foot length of the shaft and is the only way workers, supplies and ore can be transported above and below ground. It's the mine's umbilical cord. All workers come underground at the start of shift and they leave at the end of shift via the shaft. All of the employees that are going underground will load on the three decks of one of the cages stacked uh, from bottom to, to top, like three floors in an elevator. There's a hoistman that operates this uh, system. It's not automatic. Uh, he takes his signals via a bell uh, system 
So the gentleman on the, the cage will bell to a level. Uh, the hoistman then will operate that elevator uh, to the level uh, that some of the guys are going to get off on. The hoistman works in a tightly controlled layer. Dual rotating cylinders indicate where each of the two counterbalanced cages are at any given moment. When carrying workers in the cage, the hoist moves at 1,500 feet per minute. It takes four minutes to reach the 5,900 foot level. And once underground, the miners stay underground for the duration of their 10 hour shift. So once the men are in the mine at the start of shift, then we limit the travel of personnel on the shaft so that we can maximize uh, the use of the shaft for getting the ore out of the mine. The area around the shaft is one of the few illuminated parts of the mine. Here you'll find each level's nerve center, a collection of switch boxes, gauges, cables, and lifelines. Nearby, there's a small break room, plus a fully equipped maintenance shop. This is where machines brutalized by the mining process are serviced and repaired. One such machine is the man carrier. With miners on board, the man carrier chugs down the mile long, 12 foot wide, 16 foot high drift. There are a number of utilities that hang overhead, including ventilation line, uh, that as you're riding in in this equipment, sometimes you, you, there's uh, some head clearance issues that you have to be very careful about. After a bumpy six minute ride, the drift terminates at the ore headings. This is where the miners work, in a maze of dark, constricted corridors, overrun by mechanized beasts. For the unaccustomed, it may as well be another planet. Very few areas are lighted with any other light than your cap lamp. You spend the day uh, conducting some very skilled labor, if you will, in, in the dark. There's water in the, in the ground, there's water in the equipment and machines that's warm and humid. At a depth of 5,900 feet, the virgin rock temperature is about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. We would like to keep the environment down here uh, at or below about 82 degrees Fahrenheit. We blow air into the work headings, and that helps wick the heat away from, from an uh, employee's skin and keeps him cool. In a dark place, teeming with heavy equipment, where detonated explosions are a daily occurrence, communication between workers is of prime importance. Walkie-talkies can't transmit through solid rock, so miners rely on their headlamps to relay basic information. If I move my head in a circle, that means come towards me. If I move it straight up and down, it means go away from me. If I move it like this, it means stop. At the end of the narrow stopes, the ore vein is ready for mining. The main vein that we're chasing in this particular heading is this dark vein. This is the one that contains most of the lead sulfide material and the silver. Silver veins are formed when groundwater washes silver particles and other minerals into open fault lines in the earth. Under extreme pressure and across millions of years, the particles harden into ore veins. This is why silver is most often found combined with other minerals. Once processed, each ton of ore from this vein will yield roughly 18 pounds of lead, 2 pounds of zinc, and 15 ounces of silver. Like most underground mines, Lucky Friday uses a mining method called the blast, muck, and haul cycle. Every miner's goal is to complete one full cycle during his shift. Miner Jason Chambers prepares to perform the first phase of the cycle by blasting out a section of the ore vein. Using what's called a jumbo, a wheel-mounted drill, Jason bores a series of blast holes eight feet deep into the ore face. Each blast hole is packed with an ammonium nitrate-based explosive called water gel. The explosives are rigged together with detonation cord, or det cord, as miners call it. With the use of delays, the explosives will fire in a carefully planned sequence that will ensure maximum displacement of the ore. Miners call blasting 
breaking around. This is fuse primer. It has a primer on one end and an igniter on the other end. You light this end and it burns down. It takes about 10 minutes to get to here. Once this goes, it hits the deck cord. Deck cord's instantaneous. And then the sequence, oh, one, two, three, four, five. To complete the firing circuit, Jason ties the deck cord into the fuse line primer. It's not very pretty. There it is. Although it may seem antiquated, a burning fuse is the most convenient and inexpensive way to ignite a blast. The fuse burns one foot every 45 seconds. That gives Jason 10 minutes to secure the stove and reach a comfortable blast distance. As a safety precaution, our modern Marvel's crew wasn't allowed near the stove after Jason lit his fuse. But our cameras were rolling 200 yards away when his explosives finally detonated. We're fortunate to have the high quality underground miners that we have here. And when they shoot a blast like that, they're breaking around that's making silver, lead, and zinc for us. That's the sound of money being made. When a miner first enters a stope after a blast, he uses a scaling bar to bring down any loose material. When a miner drills and blasts and opens up a new foot, in a drift or in a tunnel, he is the first person to ever stand in that location, ever. It's almost like going to the moon. After scaling, miners drive four foot long expanding rock bolts into the ceiling and walls, or in mining terms, the back and ribs of the stove. The bolts compress the rock to help prevent cave-ins. To bore the holes, as well as drive the bolts, Workers use Silver Mining's perennial workhorse, the 95-pound jack-leg drill. Powered by compressed air, it emits water at the tip to keep dust at bay. This is a Gardner Denver 83 jack-leg drill. And, and this is the, the leg part of the machine. This is what actually pushes the machine forward. It's controlled by a corn top uh, valve here. The more you turn it, the more air is fed to this leg, and the harder the leg pushes, the further it goes up. To lessen the jack leg's ear-shattering clamor, miners retrofit their machines with custom noise mufflers. Rubber tires on here are actually old tires off of, of cars. When you buy a machine, it, it's bare. We put these on when we get them. With the back and ribs of his stove bolted and secured, Jason now moves in with an LHD, or load haul dump machine. He uses it to remove the broken ore, or muck as it's now called. Because LHDs are constantly backing in and out of stopes, the operator sits sideways, allowing him to easily see in both directions. Over several trips, Jason transfers all the muck from his stope to a holding area called a muck bay. From here, front-end loaders waste no time transferring the ore to 16-ton trucks. These low-slung haulers are designed with limited headroom in mind. Most mines have bigger, but these are about the biggest we can fit down here to 16-ton. The loaded 16-ton trucks head back down the mile-long drift toward the shaft entrance. A round trip they'll make an average of 35 times a day. Near the shaft entrance, the operator dumps his muck load into what's called an ore pocket. At the top of the ore pocket, there's a grizzly, which is a series of, of uh, square holes made up of crossed uh, I-beams. The square openings are sized to the maximum size of the material we want to go down that hole. Muck dumped into the ore pocket falls 70 feet and is fed to a room called the loading pocket. Here, a worker known as a cager fills a bucket, or skip, with 10-ton loads of ore. The skip is actually the top level of the elevator hoist. The material is loaded off the belt into what's called a load cell. The material or ore falls out of the loading cell into the skip. 
and then he bells the skip away and the hoistman takes it to the surface. The hoist hauls 1,000 tons of ore out of Lucky Friday every day. It's the final leg of the blast, muck, and haul cycle. But it's not the end of the line for the ore. It must now undergo processing to unlock the valuable metals trapped inside. Lucky Friday has no mine-wide communication system, so a stench-producing chemical is poured into the ventilation ducts to alert miners of an emergency evacuation. Silver mines will return on Modern Marvels, here on the History Channel. The blast muck and hull method used in underground mines like Idaho's Lucky Friday culminates with the ore being hauled to the surface. But mining and hauling is only half the battle. Now begins the process of extracting the silver and other metals from the rock. And it all begins in the crushing plant. This is the crusher. What we do is we crush the rock. It comes from the feeders and uh, it goes through all the belts, gets crushed. There's the jaw crusher, the cone crusher, and then we have the fine crusher up back there. If it doesn't go through the screen and drop down into the fine ore bin, it'll keep coming through and get crushed until it's small enough to fall through the screens and fill up the bin back there. And then from there, it goes down into the ball mill. At the ball mill, water is added to the crushed ore, which is then tumbled with thousands of three-inch diameter steel balls inside a giant rotating drum. The balls pulverize the zinc, lead, and silver into a soupy slurry mixture. The slurry is pumped into the flotation cells. These are tanks where the metals are separated from the slurry. In each cell, a frother makes bubbles, while an added chemical causes the zinc in one cell and the lead and silver in another to stick to the bubbles as they rise. Here, you're actually seeing lead float. This material uh, runs 70% lead and 120 ounces per ton of silver. Both the lead silver concentrate and the zinc concentrate are drained from the flotation cells and piped into separate thickener tanks where most of the water is removed. Once the concentrate leaves the thickener tank, that material is pumped to these vacuum filters where the moisture is sucked out of the concentrate through the filter cloth into the inside of the drum. The final product then is dry and you can see it coming off of this filter. The dry silver lead concentrate falls into collection bays in Lucky Friday's loadout facility. Here, a worker fills trucks with an average of 140 tons of the concentrate every day. It's then hauled to a refinery in Canada for further separation and purification. This is the end of the process at Lucky Friday. A process that began with a miner reporting for work at the end of a long, narrow stone. It's a wonderful place. My only description for it is uh, any day underground is a good day. Almost all modern underground mining techniques can trace their origins to the most famous silver mining venture in history. The Comstock Lode, a massive silver ore vein discovered in the mountains of western Nevada. From 1860 through 1880, uh, Nevada's Comstock Lode was just, it was the largest producing silver mine in the world. Produced $300 million worth of silver. You almost can't overstate how important the Comstock was. When word of the massive strike first spread, thousands of silver seekers poured into the boomtown of Virginia City, Nevada. The Comstock load itself took its name from one of Virginia City's most colorful characters, a drifter, fur trapper, and sometime miner named Henry Comstock. Henry Comstock was uh, a shiftless individual, to tell you the truth. Uh, he was always looking to make a buck. In June of 1859, two Irishmen, Peter O'Reilly, and Patrick McLaughlin were on the north end of the load here when Henry Comstock came by and uh, told the two men that uh, they were digging on his property, which was an outright lie, and uh, he didn't own the property. 
So they had a real quick little conference there, and they thought that two-thirds of something was better than 100% or nothing, so they, they cut him in for a one-third share. And uh, Comstock was a braggart, and uh, he was telling everybody that it was my strike, my load, and pretty soon the people from down below were saying, let's go up to the Comstock load in Virginia City, and uh, that's how it got its name. When the miners sank their first underground shafts, they had to hack through crumbling, unstable earth, which frequently collapsed on top of them. In 1859, a uh, half dozen miners died at the Ofer mine, which is in the north end of the load. That was followed immediately by the total collapse of the Mexican mine just north of it, caving from the 300-foot level all the way to the surface. It became obvious then that they would have to either improve their timbering methods or they would not be able to mine here. Desperate for help, the Comstock workers called in Philip Dietersheimer, a young graduate of Germany's prestigious Freiburg School of Mines. One of the uh, stories I've heard is that uh, he was sitting up on the surface wondering what to do um, and uh, noticed the bees coming to the sagebrush and recognized in a sudden flash of intuition uh, that the honeycomb could provide an answer. Niedersheimer's timber honeycomb was called the square set a simple wooden cube made of massive timbers. Like a honeycomb, each cube interlocked with other cubes. The interlocked cubes supported each other in layers, with floors and ceilings in between, like a giant underground building, or beehive. Basically, they're interlocking square cells of timber. They're notched to fit together, as you can see here. Uh, because they form a cube or a box, they can withstand pressure equally from all six directions. Okay. There are no nails used in the construction. The pressure of the ground holds the unit together. If we were to remove the rock from around the timber, this would all fall apart. Kept safe by the square sets and working by candlelight, the Comstock miners bored holes in the ore using sledgehammers and handheld drills. Similar to how it's done today, they filled the blast holes with dynamite the diffuse, and ran for cover. The work was brutal. The men, fearless. They were men who were, were very proud of their profession, and uh, they were well paid. They were the highest paid miners in the world here. They were paid $4 a day, which was quite good in the 1860s and 70s. They were proud to be miners, and they were pretty tough guys. Toughness was mandatory for this job. At 2,000 feet below ground, tools were too hot to handle without gloves. Miners could work only a few minutes out of every hour before the heat exhausted them. They rested in special cooling rooms where they drank cold water and sucked ice gathered from nearby mountain peaks. Keeping the Comstock miners comfortable was only half the battle. Keeping them alive continued to provide its own set of challenges. Despite the invention of the square set, working deep underground remained a dangerous and deadly pursuit. Henry Comstock sold his claim in the Ofer silver mine for $11,000. The Ofer ended up yielding $20 million in silver, and the impoverished Comstock took his own life in 1870. Silver mines will return on Modern Marvels. At the base of a tree-lined mountain in Idaho's Silver Valley stands a grim reminder of the dangers faced by every miner. A monument to the 91 men who perished in the Sunshine Silver Mine fire in 1972. At the time, the Sunshine Mine had a, a, a very large number of stopes that had uh, a lot of timber in those stopes. Somehow, a fire started in the old workings that were not accessible, and a, a large number of miners perished in that fire from carbon monoxide uh, poisoning, mainly. The tragedy led to a host of new safety regulations, including a law that requires every underground mine to provide workers with a device called a self-rescuer. How it works kind of like a snorkel. What you'll do is take your hard hat off and uh, bite down on these lugs. 
uh, just like a snorkel would be. A self-rescuer uses a chemical process to convert deadly carbon monoxide to breathable carbon dioxide. It's effective for about an hour. Improvements in safety over the last, you know, decades has been incredible. You go to any mine and there is an ethic today that safety is the most important job on the property. But things were very different back in the Comstock days when safety took a back seat to productivity. One infamous example was the invention of the steam-powered drill, later replaced by the compressed air-powered drill. The efficient new device enabled miners to work much faster and with less exertion. It also allowed mine owners to employ fewer workers. Those workers, however, discovered a disturbing downside of the device. As it penetrated rock, it produced a fine dust that ravaged their lungs when inhaled. Hundreds died of a chronic respiratory illness that came to be called miners' consumption. In today's mines, the high-powered drills emit water from their tips. The water suppresses the dangerous rock dust and keeps it from becoming airborne. In addition to miners' consumption, the Comstock laborers also risked severe burns and even lethal scalding. As the drills bored into ancient volcanic rock, they struck springs as hot as 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Tunnels often flooded with the scalding water. There's all kinds of stories about people coming, uh, having uh, bad experiences with that hot water. One I've heard a man fell in, and even though they pulled him out right away, he was so burned and so boiled that his skin was destroyed. And, uh, and they didn't live another day. Using a newly built railroad, the Comstock mines imported huge steam engines powerful enough to pump the tunnels dry. These pumps were some of the biggest steam engines in the world. The largest pumps had massive cylinders, eight feet, four inches in diameter, that weighed 43 tons. These cylinders turned a cast iron flywheel weighing 110 tons and measuring 40 feet across. The enormous flywheel drove a pump rod that plunged 3,000 feet into the earth, over half a mile. Rising and falling 10 times a minute, the pump rod could lift 2 million gallons of water from a mine in a single day. By the early 1880s, the steam-powered hoists had hauled just about all that the Comstock mines had to offer. After extracting more than 7 million tons of silver ore, worth more than $300 million, equivalent to $5 billion today, the boom days of the Comstock load were coming to an end. The miners and dreamers began leaving the area for new silver strikes in Tombstone, Arizona, and Idaho's Silver Valley. They left behind hundreds of their comrades who died mining the Comstock load. Some in the Virginia City Cemetery, others in the 750 miles of shafts and tunnels. But in decades to come, the impact of their pioneering efforts would endure. Now, the Comstock's legacy has been certainly a lot of innovation for for modern mining, we, we've adopted many of the techniques that were developed in the Comstock. Ideas about ground control, that is, how do you support the ground around you? New ideas came out of the Comstock load. Today, silver is still being mined near Virginia City, but with tools and techniques unimaginable to the pioneers of the past. The 18th century phrase, born with a silver spoon in your mouth, refers to health as well as wealth. Silver possesses antibacterial properties, and babies fed with silver spoons stayed healthier than those fed with spoons made from other metals. Silver Mines will return on Modern Marvels.
when a rich vein of silver ore is discovered deep inside the earth. Costly underground mining is the only option for extracting it. When an ore deposit is situated close to the surface and has little overburden or topsoil, open pit mining is the most effective method. Although the goal of both methods is the same, the techniques, equipment, and processes are as different as night and day. Open pit mining requires a significant footprint. It does require a lot of uh, heavy equipment. Trucks that have uh, capacities of uh, over 100 tons in most cases. Large dozers that can push with a dozer blade 14 feet wide. This is stuff that you don't see uh, in your backyard you know, every day, that's for sure. Not unless your backyard happens to be the Rochester Pit Mine near Lovelock, Nevada. Operated by Coeur d'Alene Mining, Rochester is the largest primary silver mine in the United States. Although its ore contains other valuable metals like gold and mercury, the mine's primary revenue is derived from silver. This is the only primary silver producing mine in the state of Nevada at this time. This operates uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The Rochester mine began production in 1986. And since that time, we have produced 111 million ounces of silver. If you were to take 111 million ounces of silver in a silver dollar shape and stack it up, it would go 220 miles into the air. That is how much silver we have produced here at Cool Rock Jester. Open pit mines are carved out of the earth in giant terraced levels. Like underground mining, open pit mining exposes the ore by blasting. But its detonations pack a far greater wallop. Five, four, three, two, one, fire and hole. In less than a second, the blast creates a 75,000 ton pile of ore. Shot fired. Please stand by for the all clear. The grade in an open pit mine is generally less than what we had seen in an underground mine. That means, though, that we have to move a lot more tons to get the same number of ounces as you would in an underground mine. After blasting, an assaying team tests the ore for silver content. They then produce a computer model that shows where the higher and lower grade ores are located. Around the clock, 100-ton capacity trucks wind their way out of the pit. The trucks hauling the highest grade ore dump their loads here into the insatiable maw of Rochester's massive primary crusher. The mouth of the crusher measures four by five feet and can swallow 100-ton loads littered with boulder-sized rocks. Inside are two jaws, one movable, the other stationary. The movable jaw's short, rapid motion crushes the ore, chewing it up like an animal. The jaw is driven by a 500-horsepower electric motor that propels two massive 6,500-pound flywheels. The ore exiting the primary crusher travels along a conveyor belt on its way through two more crushers. Finally, it emerges at the end, no bigger than 3 8 inch sized gravel. While all this is happening, the lower grade ore bypasses all the crushers in order to save time and money. Containing small amounts of valuable silver, it's still worth processing using the same method as the crushed ore. Because Rochester produces 50,000 tons of ore a day, a bulk processing method called cyanide heap leaching is used. It all happens on an enormous apparatus covering hundreds of acres called a leach pad. A leach pad starts as a giant plastic liner placed on inclined, compacted clay. A 20-foot deep layer of ore is then dumped onto the pad.
percolates into the ore. Cyanide leaches, or extracts, silver, gold, and other metals from the rock, like water dissolves salt. This so-called pregnant solution collects in a dike at the bottom of the pad, where it's continuously pumped out. Additional layers of ore and tubing are applied to the pad until it plunges to depths of 300 feet or more. Rochester has two leach pads. The first covers 134 acres and is currently 300 feet deep. It holds the lowest grade ore, called run of mine ore, which has bypassed the crusher. You guys are running out our drip tube. There you will run it out over the top of this run of mine material by hand. We run it out to the header line where we hook it into the nipples and put solution to it and let it run. Rochester's second leach pad holds the crushed high grade ore. A tractor buries multiple drip tube lines a few inches under the ore. Allowing for less evaporation, it's a more efficient way to deliver the cyanide solution, but impossible to do on the rocky low grade leach pad. Next stop, the processing plant. Entering the plant through a large pipe, the pregnant solution is circulated through these filter tanks, the same kind used in winemaking. The solution then travels to the de-aerator, a vacuum tower that sucks out most of the oxygen. This is done to prepare the solution for its next phase of processing, in which powdered zinc is added. Zinc has an ionic charge that enables it to efficiently attract dissolved silver and gold. If oxygen were present, this attraction would be decreased. The solution is then sent to banks of filter presses. It's here that the liquid is separated from the solids, leaving a muddy mixture of mostly silver called filter cake. When we clean the filters, this is why it comes out. We take this material, we load it into trays, we place it into a retort, which is basically a big oven. We remove the mercury, which is the byproduct for us. Material that comes out of the retort looks like this. This is what we put into the furnace. The furnace heats the filter cake until it melts at about 2200 degrees Fahrenheit. Then it's time to pour it into molds. In this state, the silver is now called doré. After a few minutes, the doré is cool enough to remove from the mold. Workers accomplish the tricky maneuver with a forklift. This is the Rochester Mines' final product, a 300-pound doré bar that is 98% silver with trace elements of gold. It will be sold and shipped to a refinery but the silver and gold will be separated and purified. Each of the Doré bars is worth about forty to $50,000 at today's prices. And my general manager always says, if you can pick up one of these bars, which weighs what, roughly 300 pounds, you can have it. But uh, I say, no way. One day, someone's going to come here and carry one off. And, I'll be $50,000 in the hole. Five, four. The incredible three, process, two, which begins with a blast and ends with a bar, is in its final days at Rochester. The pit is scheduled to close in December 2006. The processing plant will be shut down five years later. Then, a whole new chapter in the life of the mine will begin, one which will return it and the land to nature. The largest silver nugget ever found in the United States was extracted from Colorado's smuggler mine in 1894. It weighed 1,840 pounds and was worth about $35,000. At today's silver prices, that's more than $300,000. Silver Mines will return on Modern Marvels. Turn to Silver Mines on Modern Marvels. Silver Mines supply a vital material to today's world. By their very nature, however, mines can't help but affect the land, air, and water systems that surround them. Almost everything we do has an impact on the earth and mother nature, and mining's no different than anything else we do. 
So one of the major goals of, of any mining operation is to have the minimum impact that it can on the environment. Most of the environmental regulations that silver mines currently operate under are results of the Clean Air Act of 1970. Today, mining has to pay attention to the environment. It's far different than it was even when I started in the business 30 years ago. We simply cannot do the types of activities that we did 30 years ago without thinking about the environment. Back in the days of the Comstock load, there were no such things as environmental regulations. The miners took whatever they needed from the environment and poured pollutants like mercury and lead back into it to build square sets to support Comstock mines. 80 million board feet of lumber was required every year. The miners used enough lumber to build 27,000 two-bedroom homes, and in the process, stripped the hillsides around Virginia City bare. In comparison, not far from Virginia City, at the Rochester Open Pit Mine, the Coeur d'Alene Mining Company was required to post a $31.6 million bond to fund reclamation of the land. Although the open pit will remain, all the structures and leach pads will be removed and the land revegetated. This 85-acre section of hillside used to be one of Rochester's primary leach pads. We uh, shut it down in 1999 and commenced with closure. That began by uh, treating uh, the rock that's on top of the plastic liner and uh, making sure to neutralize the chemicals that remain. We placed uh, topsoil on top of that and planted it with uh, native uh, seed mix approved by the regulatory agencies. The native shrubs are coming up very nicely and uh, you can't even hardly tell that it's here. Mining the land no longer means having to leave a permanent scar. In 2005, the Hecla Mining Company received Nevada's Excellence in Reclamation Award for its cleanup work at the Rosebud Mine. After the mine closed in 2000, Hecla and its partner, Newmont Mining, removed buildings, then recontoured and revegetated the property. I'm really proud to be involved with an industry that has made such great strides that it has over the last 20 years, and certainly within the last 10 years, uh, it's gotten fantastic. Another great stride in mining is currently taking place in Australia. The government-funded Commonwealth Scientific and Research Organization has retrofitted a load haul dump machine to operate as an almost 100% autonomous robot. Seen here in early test footage, the LHD is programmed to enter a mine and report to a particular location without human intervention. The machine navigates through drifts and stopes using two laser scanners made by the SICK Corporation, one on the front and one on the rear. The devices scan in 180 degree arcs, looking for specific landmarks that have been programmed into an onboard computer. Inside the device, a laser reflects off a mirror that rotates 75 times a second. The laser bounces off the surrounding environment and returns to the device, indicating distances and topographic features. The data are then sent to the computer, and the computer operates the steering, acceleration, and braking controls. Autonomous LHDs reduce the number of miners needed and therefore cut mining costs. If there are ways to produce an ounce of silver that costs less money, that, that way is going to be used. So robotics may very well have a, a major role in the future of mining. Until that future comes, mining will continue to be done the traditional way, with muscle, might, machines, and miners.